Well, we've talked about the background to our study of First and Second Timothy so far. I've tried to build a foundation. We talked about a foundation. We dig deep. We lay the footings. We pour the cement. We begin to build the block walls. All of that becomes underground, and then the house is built on top of that. We have completed our foundation. I think we understand the city of Ephesus a little bit more. We understand a little bit about Paul, a little bit about Timothy, um, a little bit about the amount of time that Paul spent in Ephesus. I spent the time in Acts talking about the things that happened, both good and bad, and the way in which the culture and the religion clashed with this new Christianity. All of that was to help you understand that when we come to this letter called 1 Timothy and later to the one called 2 Timothy, you're going to go, oh, that's why Paul said that. If I hadn't explained that to you, you would have said, oh, that's very interesting and that's very helpful. But you always want to look, and this is what we learned in our, in our How to Study the Bible course, you always want to look and find out why the author wrote what he did. Yes, he was inspired by God. He said exactly what God wanted him to. But what these authors wrote, and in particular Paul here, he wrote in a certain context, in a certain reason. And so you learn to look for those clues that help you say, ah, so if that was true in Ephesus then, and that helps me understand that, then you can make application out of that, in, that understanding or the interpretation that will help you today. Now, we're done with all of the background, so it's time for us to start our study of 1 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, you can take and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. But before we do that, let me, let me give you an illustration to help you understand the whole idea of what this letter and even 2 Timothy is going to be about. So I'll, I'll give you the point after I tell you the story. One of the things that I did not tell you about myself is that I had a rare liver disease a number of years ago. Uh, it was not because of alcohol or drinking or anything that I had done. I, I received a disease that affected my internal organs and especially my liver. And what would happen was every three days I would get this pain. Your liver is on your right side underneath your rib cage. It's just right under here and it's about the size of an American football if that's interesting to you. I had a disease where inside this liver things would, would back up and pressure would be created. I would feel this pain and this pressure. And then finally it would go away after a few hours and then I would go, oh, that was awful. So I went to some specialists and they said, uh, Mr. Dick, you have this particular disease and here's what's wrong with you. So if you can picture a tree, and a tree has a large trunk at the bottom and the branches that go out from the trunk they get smaller the farther away they go from the trunk. Does that make sense to you? What happened is there would be narrowing inside the small branches, the tiny little ones far away from the trunk. And so when the bile would try to pass through, it would, it would stop. And so that's why there was pressure. And so there's disease was in these tiny little uh, vessels inside my liver. And they said, Mr. Dick, we would like to try a special medication on you. And I said, okay, that would be fine. And so for a number of years I took this medication and it worked and I, I did quite well. And then uh, a number of years they said, well, we'd like to try something else. And they, they had treated me so well, I said that would be fine. And it didn't work so well. So what would happen would be my skin would turn kind of yellowish green. And, and people would look at me and say, are you feeling well? And I'd say, well, I, I feel okay, but I look strange. So. The, the whites of my eyes would have a kind of a yellow look. If you look at the skin on my hands or on my face, it would kind of look yellow. It's called jaundice is the name for that. And I would preach on Sunday, and as I was shaking hands with people on the way out of church, they would say, Pastor Bruce, uh, you're not feeling too well today, are you? And they, they could tell by just looking at me. So after a number of years of having this disease, the, the hospital, the medical center where I was being served said, you're going to need a transplant. And so you need to get on this list and we'll tell you what that means and the day will come when you're going to receive a liver transplant. And so there are all kinds of details in the story that I don't need to tell you, at least today. But the day came when I, I received the phone call that said, Mr. Dick, we have a liver for you. It was a young man who had died 
and his liver matched mine and they said please come to the hospital now and you're going to have this surgery so i did it was a six hour surgery a very large incision and they replaced my diseased liver with this young man's liver and my health is is very good but one of the things that they told me after my surgery was now mr dick you're going to have to uh, live your life with some different qualifications now we want you to exercise we want you to eat good foods and get plenty of rest and the exercise was no problem because I like athletics and I was exercising and playing sports um, but the, the certain foods please don't add salt to your food because it, these drugs that you're gonna take are very hard on your heart and they're very hard on your kidneys and I said okay so what essentially was going to happen was that my behavior had to change a little bit. But the reason that my behavior had to change was because of something that I now believed. So what I believed was I want to live as long a life as possible. I don't know how long my life will last. They say I could live a full life. And I believe that if I live my life and I take my medication and I exercise and I eat right, that my behavior will be a reflection of what I believe. I don't simply do the things I do for no reason. I do what I do because of a belief behind the behavior. I'm going to give you a phrase that I want you to remember throughout our study of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, and it's simply this. Belief drives behavior. Belief drives behavior. Now I can't speak for you here in Russia, but here's what's happening in America these days. Most of our psychology and, and most of what happens in uh, working with children who have problems or working with adults who have problems, they say, if you will change your behavior, then this will happen. If you will do this, then this will be better. If you don't do this, this will be better. When you talk to people only about their behavior but not about the underlying belief system, it's never going to work. And so a lot of what's happening with psychology in America is only working about this well. And the reason is there is a belief system behind the behavior. You see, I believe that what the doctors told me about my health is true. I believe that they said I can maximize my life if I will do certain behaviors. But I don't start with behavior, I start with belief. If you understand that concept that belief drives behavior, you'll understand almost everything of what you're going to see in, the, in these next few chapters of this letter. Because what's happening in, in what Paul is writing to Timothy is that their belief system was under attack. Paul could have said, I want you to do this, I want you to do this, I don't want you to do this, I don't want you to do that. Well, Paul says, Timothy, here's what's happening. They're telling you things to believe and to not believe that are not true, and it's having an effect on how they behave. And it's very important that you understand that. And don't worry if you don't fully understand that right now, because I'm going to say it so many times over the next few sessions together that you're going to finally go, ah. So for example, when, when we instruct our children, uh, one of our children, and I won't name his name because he would be embarrassed, struggles with anger. He has a very short temper, a very short fuse. If something happens, he's angry just like that. And I could say, don't be angry. Stop being angry. That's behavior. But if I sit down and talk to him and I say, son, what is it that's making you angry? Well, my sister did this to me. My brother did this to me. Well, Landon, what is that saying about what you believe about, what is that saying about what you believe about yourself or who you are or what you believe about God? Now, it's very slow to work on belief and not behavior. See, the reason we like to work with behaviors is that you can have an effect right now. But when you work on what a person believes, that takes time. And you invest time in people. So I say all of that so that you understand what Paul is doing with Timothy here is he's not just giving him a list of things to do. They're based on an underlying belief system. 
We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. So when we find Paul writing to Timothy, we've talked about this in the background a little bit. Paul, we believe, is up north in Macedonia. Timothy is in Ephesus. Paul has been released from prison in Rome for the first time, and he has some freedom to travel. And so Timothy is on his heart and on his mind, and as he travels, he's thinking, Oh, Timothy, that's right. When I left him, he was so sad that I left, and there was so much work to do in Ephesus. And there wasn't just one church in Ephesus. There was a whole group of churches in Ephesus. He goes, I should write him a letter. And he sits down, and he begins to write him this letter. And what we begin to find is the first parts of that. So look with me at verses 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. This begins his greeting. This begins his salutation. It says this, 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. Now, he calls himself an apostle of Christ Jesus. Maybe you remember his story. He was on the Damascus Road. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest these new Christians, part of the way it was called. And all of a sudden, a voice comes down out of heaven, and it says, Saul, that was his other name, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. And Paul's life changed that day. And God said to Paul, Paul, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. I'm going to send you to places you can't even imagine. He says, I am, an, I, am, I am an ambassador. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by command of God. He wasn't one of the 12 that Jesus had selected. It was Jesus Christ, risen and exalted, who said, Paul, I want you to be an apostle. I want you to be part of my ambassadors with this gospel message. He says, of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. And then he says in verse 2, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. In our background material, we said, we don't think that Paul led Timothy to Christ, that most likely his mother and his grandmother or the surroundings in which he learned about the gospel, he probably became a, a Christian through them. But he, he became this, I, I tell our people back home, a protege. He, he was, it was a young follower of Paul, that everywhere Paul went, Timothy went too. It's like he was a child. He just took him under his wing and said, Timothy, just come with me. Learn from me. And so we said in our background study that they traveled together and that they spent all this time together. He says, Timothy, you are my true child in the faith. Paul didn't have any children of his own, but Timothy is as close to having a son as anyone could ever have. And he gives this little greeting before he launches into his discussion. He says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Whenever Paul would begin a letter, he would give some similar kind of way. And here he says, grace, mercy, and peace. And I wonder to myself, I wonder if this is exactly what Timothy needed. My layperson's understanding of grace and mercy, this is how it was kind of taught to me, is grace is giving you a favor you don't deserve. Mercy is not giving you something you do deserve. Theologically, there are much deeper understandings, but I've always liked that. Grace is giving you something you did not deserve. Now, those of you who are listening to the recording, you don't know what I did between sessions, but I brought some chocolate candies with me, and I distributed to the people in the class here. I gave them. That was a gift of grace. Now, maybe they deserved it. I've just gotten to know them a little bit. But I placed on each person's hand or in front of their table two pieces of chocolate candy. That is a gift of grace. I don't even know them yet. I'm just beginning to get to know them, but I gave them out of love and a compassion for them because I want to be in relationship with them. I don't think that they, I don't know if they deserved it, but I just gave it to them. Now, mercy is the complete opposite. It's not giving them something they do deserve. Now, suppose that my students began a revolt. We don't like your teaching. You're boring. You talk too fast. You talk too slow. We don't like your English. We want a new teacher. At that point, I could get up and I could leave and I could go and do something. I'm not teaching that class. They don't appreciate all my work and all my travel. But mercy would be giving them something they don't deserve, love and compassion, even though they treated me poorly. 
Grace is giving you something you don't deserve. Mercy is withholding from you what you do deserve. That I, I, if you treated me in a poor way, what you deserve is for me to be harsh with you. But mercy says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And Paul says, I, Timothy, if I could lavish on you God's grace and God's mercy, and then he talks about peace. And peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the ability to find comfort and solace from a great God, even in the midst of a storm. And all of that is just part of Paul's greeting to Timothy. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.